The next Minnesota-Denver game isn't until Friday. Minnesota took a 2-0 lead over Denver. And there was a moment like around the second quarter in that game when it was just clear that this was now Clubber Lang in the first fight against Rocky where you just like, oh my God, they can't, they can't hold these guys off. We talked about it a little on the Sunday pod with Versillo about what if they're just ready now? What, like we've seen this over the course of NBA history. Sometimes teams are just ready and we never expect it, but they're ready to go and and then we all look at each other and we can't believe it. And then it happens. In this case, it's happening. So my question, if you remember once upon a time, I, I did a whole chapter about what ifs on my book of basketball. I did the 33 biggest what ifs. I got to do that again because there's probably more what ifs now. I have Kevin Durant's involved in at least four of them. What if Minnesota sweeps? What if they sweep Denver? Just as a thought exercise, what are all the ramifications of that? We leave the weekend. I think they play on Sunday and Rosillo and I are talking about a Minnesota sweep. What are, what are the outputs of this? Well, here's the biggest one. Anthony Edwards becoming the king of the NBA is officially in play. What does that mean? Well, he's averaging a 32 and a seven and a six and over and over again is just making these crazy supernatural plays. I was talking to a friend of mine today on the phone about it. The game sped up on Jokic, those two, game one and game two, Minnesota was able to speed it up and he was playing at this weird pace that we've a little frantic. Like he just kind of couldn't, couldn't grab control of the horse. And the opposite happened for Edwards. Edwards, it looks like everything's slowing down. He's starting to look like Bradley Cooper in Limitless. I was watching Limitless over the weekend and there's that moment at the end when he's talking to De Niro and De Niro's like, you're going to fuck with me. I'll come right at you. And, and Bradley Cooper's like, do you understand what's happening right now? There's going to be a car accident right over there. Watch this. Guy's going to be looking at his phone. Car accident happens. Everything is slowed down for Edwards. Shit's going on. All of a sudden, he has this mid-90s turnaround Michael Jordan shot that Jordan took years and years and years to craft and perfect. I'm not comparing to Michael Jordan. I'm just saying. All of a sudden, he has this bankable turnaround shot where he can physically push down, get to the spot that he wants, and then just easily shoot over basically anybody they put on him. Aaron Gordon, cool. I'm just going to go by you. Everything slowed down for this dude. So, all right. What does that mean? What if he goes through KD and Booker in round one? What if he goes through the defending champs and Yoka Jamuri in round two? Next round, Luke or SJ, they're going to be favored in that. And then Tatum and Brown in the last round, I've already watched him go head to head with those guys and he couldn't be less scared of them. What if they win the title and he runs through all those dudes and wins finals MVP? Like this is on. Here's what else is going to happen. Team USA late July. Well, this now turns into a 92 Michael Jordan. Hey, I know you love all these old guys, but I'm also here. We, he's in the Netflix series. Netflix is doing that NBA show that's basically modeled after quarterbacks. I think LeBron's in it, Jimmy Butler, Tatum's in it, Anthony Edwards is in it. Um, from what I've heard, he is very, very, very loving of all the cameras and all the attention and all the different stuff that comes with that series. And uh, they're predicting he might be the star of the series. Not surprising if you watched Hustle with Adam Sandler when he stole every scene he was in in Hustle. So you have that endorsements, sneakers, commercials, hosting SNL, all that stuff becomes in play. And then um, just like the, the future of the league, again, this is a thought exercise. I'm not, I'm not overreacting. I'm not prisoner of moment. I'm just saying, what if he sweeps Denver and then it keeps going? We went from Jordan, dead spot, Kobe and Shaq, they showed up. Great. Hey, hey guys. Then it eventually became Kobe and LeBron. Little Wade mixed in there for a split second. Turned into LeBron and Curry. And now we're hitting the tail end of LeBron and Curry, it feels like. And we're all looking around going, well, who's, is it just going to be foreign dudes that are running the league? It's going to be Giannis and Jokic and Luka. What, are we going to have an American guy under 30 take the reins here? And then Ant comes in and he's like, I am doing a Michael Jordan impersonation for um, the entire playoffs. How about that? Will that do it for you? I'm the most charismatic, fun guy the league's had um, in God knows how long. Will, is that enough for you? Um, so there's that. He even 
squashed the MJ goat thing already. He was like, don't compare me to him. He's the greatest player of all time. I don't want to, that's not fair to me or him. Don't compare him to me. He had that quote, which also was a weird way to get on the board with the MJ LeBron goat conversation where he's like, Michael Jordan is clearly the best player of all time. I can't wait to see how LeBron reconciles that. The point is that the biggest what if outcome of a Denver sweep, if they pull this off, is Ant becoming the king of the NBA world. Zen play. There's more stuff I have for you. Minnesota, they become the title favorites regardless of what the odds say. Right now in Fando, Boston's even money, plus 100 to win the title. Minnesota's plus 290. OKC's plus 750. Denver's 15 to 1. The odds are better for Boston because there's more risk against Fando and whoever's taking those bets on Boston. In the Minnesota, the odds drop. But to me, Minnesota becomes the favorite in that series because of the way they're playing, the way they're playing defense. Uh, the poor Zingas question. If you're giving me poor Zingas in the Minnesota series, I'm more interested. Now I think Boston with game seven at home. But right now with me not knowing what's going to happen with poor Zingas, Minnesota has to be favored in that series. Here's another thing. Man, this one. I had to break out another stupid pyramid for you guys. I was thinking about the best defensive teams I've ever seen um, since the ABA NBA merger which was the 76-77 season. Underrated Blazers year there, by the way, if you're talking about the defensive teams. But um, the best defensive team I've ever seen, and playoffs have to matter. Don't get me like, oh, the 2016 Spurs, the regular season defensive rating. I'm talking like when the fucking money's on the table, what defense do you want? And it's down to the 04 Pistons and the 89 Pistons. Those are the two best defensive teams I've ever seen since I've been watching basketball, I wasn't old enough to see Bill Russell. And by the way, if we're doing best defensive teams of all time, it starts with pick nine Bill Russell teams. The 70 Knicks are probably in there somewhere. And then it's all the modern teams. But Russell and whoever is the best defensive team of all time. I'm going to go with the 04 Pistons because um, a couple things were going on there. One, the rules were in their favor. I'm going to talk with Ethan Sherwood Strauss later about how the rules changed in 04 and that he's. 2024 is a little somewhere. Um, ben Wallace, Rashid Wallace, those dudes together and Rashid Wallace really giving a shit. So you're protecting the rim. You can switch on anyone. They were probably the two best defensive bigs in the league. Duncan's probably 2B to Rashid 2A at that point. Um, Tayshaun Prince, shut down guy on the sides. And then the Billups, Hamilton backcourt, plus the way they played together. And they just, ripped through the playoffs and we still didn't totally believe there are five to one underdogs in the finals, which was ridiculous. And they ended Kobe and Shaq. It was done. They finished them. So I think about the 04 Pistons, it's not just how unbelievable it was to watch them. Very similar to basically what we're watching in this Minnesota Denver and what we watched with some of the Minnesota Phoenix stuff, where it just feels like they have eight guys, but there's only five. They can protect everything. They're just they're, they're able to change the flow of a game and the pace and just teams are on their heels. Kobe was so bad in that final series. It's, it, it was like shocking. We couldn't believe it. It was, this was Kobe at the basically peak of his athletic powers. Like even by the time he got to 2006, I don't think he was as unbelievable as an athlete as he was in that 01 to 04 stretch. But um, that's the best defensive team I've ever seen. The 89 Pistons are second. When I did my book, I think I had them as the fourth best team of all time. And it was partly because they were so malleable with their lineup. But, you know, they had Rodman, who's whatever short list you want to make for the best defensive players ever, he's on it. Uh, they had Joe Dumars. They had um, they had the, the collective, you know, John Sally. They had all these different, you want to go small ball, we can do that. If, you, if you're going to play three guards against us, we can guard that. They just were the Swiss Army Knife defensive team and they're physical as fuck. And they just want to beat the shit out of you. Impossible to play against. I have them second. And I think the number three spot right now I would have for the 91 Bulls who go back and look at the stats for that. I think the points allowed that season for them in the playoffs was like eight or nine points lower than everybody else. MJ at his athletic peak. Pippen really coming together as one of the most important defensive players in the history of the league. And they throw Pippen on MJ and the series changes. Horace Grant's in there. That team was just loaded. I would have them in the three spot, but I think the T-Wolves have a chance to take it, which is why I mentioned this. 
So if I'm doing a pyramid, 04 Pistons top, the next spot would be the 89 Pistons and the 91 Bulls. Next spot, the third level would be the 99 Spurs, which I'm always going to be partial to because it was the one time they got Robinson and Duncan together, the Twin Towers, where they're just like, you just weren't, you're not getting in the rim on these guys. It's not happening. It's never happening. Collectively, that team was just a nightmare. Then you have the 96 Bulls, which was the older, wiser version of the 91 Bulls. I made a rule that it had to be at least five years between teams. So like you couldn't do the 89 Pistons and the 90 Pistons. It's not fair. They're basically the same team. 96 Bulls, you're adding Rodman, older, wiser MJ Pippen. And by that time, I wrote about that, that in my book about how those guys, it was like MJ had just trained his shadow defensively in Pippen. And those guys, the way they moved was unbelievable to watch. So I would put the 24 T-Wolves pretty close to that third tier at this point. Um, The last tier is 08 Celtics, who were an awesome regular season defensive team. And then playoffs, a little more hit or miss, especially when they went smaller lineups. The 92 Knicks were incredible. Um, they ended up losing in round two to MJ and seven, but they, man, they just like basically took the Pistons thug ball and they went to a whole other level with it and turned every game into a rugby match. Oh, three Pacers with, uh, our test and Jermaine O'Neal and, uh, just the rules were really good. And then the Oh five Spurs, I had to have a Spurs team from that era with Duncan and Bruce Bowen and Manu and all those guys. And I think it would probably be the Oh five Spurs. The point is that if the T-Wolves sweep the Nuggets and they're able to beat Jokic the way they're beating him. At the three spots in play for me, it really is. I it's that between them and the ninety one Bulls for the best defensive teams I've ever seen in my life. Like the the size they have. This is another outcome. The Jaden McDaniel's, who has not only would you call him one of the best perimeter defensive players in the league. Now he's starting to be like, wow, the, where does this guy rank for best perimeter players we've seen in the last like ten to twelve years? just an absolute shutdown. It's like having the ultimate shutdown corner in football or something. Um, And then the size of Gobert and Towns and Nas Reed, who was so crucial against Jokic. And then Edwards, who we talked about earlier, but, you know, the defense is, is one of the things that makes him so special. This was the thing Kobe always had from basically like 99, 2000, 2001, as he was trying to figure out who he was offensively. He was trying to figure out how to play with Shaq. But the defense where it was like, man, this guy's going to make some all defensive teams. And especially in the playoffs, he, he could just lock people down. And Edwards has that too. The competitiveness, the ability to go both ways. They never seem tired. Uh, the difference is Edwards physically is just way stronger than Kobe was. Kobe, you go back and you look at those early Kobe years and he's just thinner and, and um, just you look at 06, 08, 09, it, he's just kind of filled out and stronger and he can take contact in different ways. The guys in the, the guy in those early years was just this pretty skinny, amazing athlete who was competitive as shit. Edwards is already built like he could walk on a football field and run for 1,500 yards. Uh, another outcome, the Go Bear trade, much ridiculed on this podcast, goes from being one of the craziest trades ever made. And I still, by the way, feel like it's one of the craziest trades ever made to an incredible look ahead moment by Tim Connolly because I thought, look, I went on the record. I thought what they gave away was insane. I thought they gave 210 cents on the dollar. But even if you're going to justify it, it made no sense because Ant wasn't close to being Ant yet. It's like by the time NBA history says he's going to start peaking by the time he's 24, 25, which would be the end of this contract. So you're trading for this guy in a win now mode, but the guy that you need to help you win now isn't ready yet. Well, obviously Tim Connolly saw something and was like, this guy's going to be ready sooner than we thought. And maybe he looked at the history of MJ and Wade and Kobe and all these dudes that age David Thompson, all these guys age 22 to 23 and their ability to potentially just be superstars out of nowhere when you're least expecting it. Did he see that? Did he just want to have a competitive team away right away? I don't know, but, um, putting Gobert and the rest of the size they have behind Ant and McDaniels turned out to be one of the shrewdest things of the decade. I'll never apologize for my take on the Gobert trade. I, gave, I think they gave away too much, but it worked. Uh, another outcome, Towns, much maligned. You know, on a scale of Ben Simmons to 10, 
Towns was probably a three, meaning negative. Like, just like I, I give up on this dude as being a winning basketball player. I don't see it. I don't know if he's wired to win games correctly. Uh, all the dumb fouls, like the stuff, even you saw it this year when he went for 60 in that meaningless game and his coach benched him. You know, it's like he was a classic. He's never going to get a guy. And Edwards is so great now that he's sucked him into the greatness. And this version of Towns is unbelievable. Like the way he's playing defense against Denver, holy shit. Uh, so now he's, uh, he went from a, how can you win with this dude to, wow, you can win with this dude. That's the thing about basketball. Never, never give up on talent, apparently. Uh, a couple more outcomes. The new rules become legendary if Minnesota wins. They changed it. Ethan and I are going to talk about this in the next segment, but they changed the rules midseason. It ends up being absolutely perfect for, for Minnesota specifically and leads to um, them, again, in this what-if scenario, sweeping the Nuggets and becoming the favorite to win the title. There's a Phoenix outcome here if they if the Nuggets get swept where maybe we have to go back and reevaluate Phoenix a little bit, which Phoenix just seemed like, whoa, what do they do? Blow it up. They have no picks. This is a wrap to, eh, they won 49 games and they went against one of the, of, uh, the all-time hot playoff teams and a team that I'm now talking about historically as a defensive team. And, you know, they didn't have a point guard. They barely had a center. Like maybe we should give them a little more slack because they made Denver just look as bad as Phoenix. So if I'm a Phoenix fan, I feel slightly better about it. Uh, Denver, if they get swept, they take a a big historical hit. As you know, I'm a giant Jokic fan. Um, this gets tough to defend because Denver, who I think we were doing the podcast segments last year, and we Doc and I talked about it the night of the finals, is like, is this team positioned now to go on a run here to win like three titles in four years, three titles in five years? Um, now they're if they got swept, they move into, yeah, they won that title, but, and they move into that group. You know else in that group? The 22 Warriors. Sorry, you're in it. You lucked out with some of the teams you played. The 21 Bucks. Yeah. You're in there too. The 2020 Lakers bubble, 2019 Raptors. Yeah, KD and Clay Thompson got hurt in the same series. Really, our last champ that wasn't polarizing in any way was the 2018 Warriors. It's very hard to leave a season, 2012 Heater like this too, um, where we leave the season going, yeah, that was the best team, no question. Um, I still, there's a piece of me that feels that the 2009 Lakers you could have made a real case for Orlando in that series, but 2008 Celtics, good example. Yeah, that was the best team. I felt that way about Denver last year, but now it's like, eh, well, maybe. I wonder if that's who they played. I don't personally believe that. I'm just saying it's now in the air. And the other thing that's in the air for them is they had this big, we're smarter than everybody. We're going length and young guys and we're going to be so hard to play, but they bet on young guys and they bet on young guys the same way that the Warriors bet on their young guys last year. Ah, we can throw away, toss away some stuff on the bench where it's time to bet on your young guys. When you're betting on young guys, guess what happens? Um, sometimes young guys don't show up. Sometimes they're up and down. Sometimes they're unpredictable. And you think about Minnesota, some of the guys they're bringing off the bench, they're like pretty experienced dudes, right? They have a nice blend of experience and youth that I think in this series, we're going to find out on Friday night, can Denver trust Christian Brown? Can they trust Peyton Watson? Because they're going to need younger legs to fight off this crazy Minnesota buzzsaw. Conversely, if Minnesota wins the title, and again, this is a what if exercise, they sweep Denver, they beat OKC or Dallas, which would mean they beat either Luca or they beat Shea, who's going to be second in MVP. And then they beat, after beating the defending champs and some of the best players in the league, they go and they beat the 64 win Celtics and Jason Tatum. This becomes one of the better fuck yeah titles we've had in a while. Because like, I think like Dallas in 2011 is an awesome example of this, right? Dirk, who much maligned, he just runs through everybody. He runs through Kobe and he runs through Durant and then he gets to the finals and he runs through uh, the, the LeBron Wade Bosch team. And he's just like, just taking skeletons in every series. This would be a taken skeleton series from, series from Minnesota. This was not a year where it's like, oh, well, you guys lucked out because this guy got hurt or that guy got hurt. This would be like, they're going through some fucking good teams here. And uh, and it would just be really impressive 
I mean, it'd be one of the more impressive titles I've seen. Um, which leads me to one more outcome here. There's two different, I mentioned this a little on Sunday with Rosillo, but there's two different levels of surprise NBA moments when we get to the playoffs. One is the, wait, we're doing this now? Um, where it's like the 2012 Thunder. It's like, oh, I guess they're going to make the finals now. The 1977 Portland Trailblazers, same thing. 2015 Golden State, 30 to one to win the title before the year. Cousin Sal and I bet on it. Um, and then it was like, okay, I guess they're going to beat Memphis. I guess we're doing this now. So Minnesota would go down that lane. But also in this Denver series, and this is what I talked about with Brazil on Sunday, I was like, yeah, I, I think this sweep is possible because we've seen this happen over the course of NBA history. We saw it happen with the 04 Pistons, split with the two games in Lakers, blew them out. 14 Spurs, split the two, first two with the Heat, blew them out. Last three games weren't close. 91 Bulls sweep the Pistons. And you could feel it in the second quarter of that game. It wasn't just that they were beating Denver. It was like they were ending Denver, at least for this season. They were taking, they were sucking the soul out of Jokic. They were ruining Murray to the point that he fucking threw something on the court. Um, it wasn't just they beat them. They were snatching souls from them. And I don't know if Denver comes back from that. Um, but that's another outcome of this. Now, this is a part of the what-if sweep thing, but if Jokic can somehow figure this out and pull them back, they're still 15-1 to 1 to win the title. They, they, all the odds are saying that they can't come back from this. Um, if he can somehow figure out this monster of an opponent and pull his team back, um, this would be one of the great things I've seen from a basketball player because he's just, especially with Murray, clearly not 100% with the lack of a bench and how hungry and motivated Minnesota is compared to Denver who won the title last year. Um, to flip this series at this point would just be nuts. It's the worst possible opponent for him. They have a ton of size. Uh, they have guards that can just pressure Murray and pressure him and pressure him and use length. And it's just a nightmare for them. If he could pull this out, it'd be great. The flip side for him is that if they don't pull it out and they get swept, this is the last outcome of the series from a what-if standpoint. The Jokic haters come out in full force. The people that never believed, even when he won three MVPs in four years, even when he won the title in a finals MVP, even when he averaged over the course of four playoff seasons dating back to 2021, I think he's 30, 13, and eight. He's like unequivocally one of the great offensive players in the history of the playoffs, no matter how this turns out. And the haters will still come out in full force and be like, see, told you, he wasn't that good. Man, just throw some defense at him. He looked out last year with who he played. He's going to get all that stuff. What does that do for Jokic? Does it go in the lab? Does it become like a, I mentioned Rocky Three earlier, it's become now Rocky Four things back in the log cabin. Like now he's lifting Paulie and Adrian. Um, here's why this is stupid. Just about every great player has sucked in a playoff series or played below their level or just caught the wrong opponent at the wrong time. This is part of NBA history. And it's going to sound like I'm making excuses for him, but I'm not. Um, a good example I mentioned earlier was Kobe in that Piston series in 04. Worst possible team for him to play. Team was splintered. It was a bad Lakers season just in general. 22.1 points a game in the finals, 38% field goal. Not great. LeBron against uh, Dallas in 2011. Terrible opponent for him. Sean Marion, Tyson Chandler behind him. Uh, Dallas had really kind of figured out that Miami offense and LeBron got into his own head and it, the pressure was too much for him. The season was too much for him. 18 points a game in the finals. 18, seven and seven from LeBron James in a finals when he's like kind of near his, his, his apex. Um, it happens. MJ, my guy the greatest of all time against Orlando in 1995 comes back from baseball. Guess what? Orlando kind of kicked his ass. I don't care what the stats say. Go watch some of those games on YouTube. Larry Bird, my favorite basketball player of all time against the 88 Pistons. Got his ass kicked. Coming off the Hawks series against Dominique or the duel and he beats Dominique. It's, oh my God, Larry's going to pull this off. And then, you know what he wasn't expecting? It was Dennis Rodman in the next round. And uh, his body was starting to break down. Same thing for Magic Johnson against the Celtics in 84, where he just sucked. They were calling him Tragic Johnson after the finals. KD against uh, Golden State in 2016, where they're up 3-1. 
they have a chance to finish it. And he just doesn't play well. Uh, every Will Chamberlain playoffs against Bill Russell, basically, ex- except for 1967. I can keep going and going and going and going. This happens. This is the wrong time, wrong opponent, wrong season for a Jokic Minnesota matchup. And what I'm interested for is what they would do going forward under this what if scenario of what if Minnesota sweeps. If they get swept, what does the team look like next year? What are the moves? What was wrong? What do they do? Because Tim Connolly built Minnesota to beat Denver. Now Denver has to rebuild themselves to not only beat Minnesota, but you also have OKC coming. You have Boston in the East. This is uh, an unbelievable turn of events. I bet on Minnesota. I think I talked about this in the pod at 16 to one with like three weeks to go in the season, just because I felt like they had defense. They had a good coach and there was a puncher's chance and Ant went up a level. And then by the time the playoffs started, I was picking Phoenix against them in round one. So I'm not taking a victory lap um, because I watched Phoenix just make them look like they were a year away from being ready. But Ant went up a level and here we are. I think Minnesota is going to get, going to sweep Denver. I think the series, it's, I, I've been through these a few times as a fan and I think this one's done. And, uh, and basketball is about to change as we know it. So there you go. <laughs> 